All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Carmel Shahar, and I am the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. We are thrilled that you could join us today for reproductive rights in 2020. Before I introduce the event, a few housekeeping things. First of all, if you are not on our newsletter mailing list, I would suggest that you join it. It's only because that's how we publicize our events. This newsletter comes out only twice a month. We have some really fantastic events. In fact, on July 29th, we are going to have a follow-up event, COVID-19 and the Politics of Reproductive Health Global Perspectives, which is going to bring speakers from countries such as Argentina, Peru and Kenya to discuss the impact that the pandemic has had on reproductive rights in their country. So I suspect if you're interested in this event, you will be interested in that event. We will also have events coming up throughout the summer and fall on topics such as access to COVID-19 treat treatment and vaccines for communities of color, as well as an exploration of the ethics and legality of IVF add-on procedures. So please join the mailing list. Some specifics about this event, and this is where in person I might tell you where to find the bathrooms in the building. We don't need to worry about that here, but you might be asking yourself, how will I ask a question of the esteemed panelists? You have two methods to do that. The first is to use the Q&A feature of Zoom. If you move your mouse down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see it. You can submit a question that way. If you're an attendee, you won't see the questions that have been submitted but not yet answered, but rest assured we are getting them. Or if you would like to submit your question via Twitter, please join the conversation at hashtag RepoWrites2020. Again, that's hashtag RepoWrites2020. Some ways that are not good ways to ask a question is to use the chat feature on the Zoom. Please do not use that or to use the raising the hand icon on Zoom. We will not be monitoring that. But we do welcome your questions, again, through the Q&A feature and by using the Twitter hashtag, RepoWrites2020. With that, I'd like to introduce the event itself. 2020 has been a really eventful year, and that is no exception when it comes to reproductive rights. The Supreme Court decided June Medical Services which is the first abortion-related case following significant changeover in the court composition. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, has had a significant impact on access to abortion, sexual health, and reproductive health services. For example, can we deliver some of these services via telehealth when that has never really been done before in significant numbers? We have a really all-star lineup today to join us in a moderated discussion of June Medical, as well as what we're seeing in this new pandemic landscape for reproductive rights. I will introduce them in no particular order. We have Mary Ziegler, Stearns Weaver Miller, Professor of Law at Florida State University College of Law, and one of the lead organizers of this event. So thank you, Mary, for helping us organize it. We have Jamil Fields Allsbrook. Director of Women's Health and Rights at the Center for American Progress. We have Louise P. King, Director of Reproductive Bioethics at the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics and Assistant Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology at Harvard Medical School. We have Julie Breckelman, Senior Director, Center for Reproductive Rights and the Lead Attorney for the Plaintiffs in June Medical Services. Moderating our panel will be Emily Bazelon, staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School. With that, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick off the moderated discussion. Thanks so much, Carmel. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm really excited. This is an amazing array of speakers um, and I can't wait to dig into this topic. Um, I want to quickly, I realized that I had Mary's new book sitting on the shelf right next to my desk, 
Um, so I just want to hold it up for anyone who doesn't know about this terrific work. Um, I really recommend it. It's excellent. So um, think about that while we're talking. we will be a big advertisement for this one. Um, so I, I'm going to start with Julie. Um, Julie, you did an amazing job litigating June Medical at the Supreme Court. Um, there were many rave reviews, <laughs> which I'm sure means that an incredible amount of work went into this. Um, can you tell us about this case, um, how it came to the court, what your kind of strategy and thinking was in trying to get uh, a majority of justices to um, to agree with your clinic's position and strike down this Louisiana law, which was making it um, much for, for, to provide abortions in Louisiana. Yes, thanks, Emily. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I'd love to tell everyone about the case. I think there are really two important things to know about this case. So first of all, it was a case about a Louisiana law that is really a clinic closing law. If this law had taken effect, it would have left only one abortion clinic in the entire state of Louisiana. So it would have decimated access in the state. And it's important for people to know that access to abortion is already difficult in Louisiana. So this law taking effect would have made it nearly impossible for most people to really access those services. And when Louisiana passed this particular clinic closing law, which is called an admitting privileges law, it claimed that the reason it was passing this law was because it wanted to protect patient's health and safety, but that was incredibly deceptive and underhanded because the medical consensus against these types of laws really could not be more clear. Every major medical organization in the United States opposes these types of admitting privileges laws because they don't do anything for patient's health and safety, and all they do is close clinics and the impact of that is actually to undermine people's health and safety because they can't access services that they need. So that's sort of the first important thing to know about this case. The second thing to know about it is that it was really sort of deja vu all over again. This case is about a law that is identical to a Texas law that the United States Supreme Court struck down just four years ago in 2016 in another case that the center had litigated. And the Texas law literally is word for word pretty much the same as the Louisiana law. And the Supreme Court said in 2016 that this Texas law uh, was unconstitutional, that it was an undue burden on people's ability to access abortion because it closed half the clinics in the state of Texas and it did absolutely nothing for patients' health and safety. So the court recognized that the law was without using the words in the opinion that the law was really a pretext, um, that Texas claimed that it wanted to protect patients, but really all it wanted to do was shut down access to abortion. So in creating our legal strategy for this case, our goal was really to show the court that this was the same case, that nothing had changed in the last four years, and that there was no principled legal basis for reaching a different outcome in this case than they had reached four years ago. Um, and what was really critical is that there was a trial in this case. The, the district court judge, federal district court judge in Louisiana in Baton Rouge said this case was the same. He said that this law did nothing for uh, patients' health and safety in Louisiana. He recognized the medical consensus and he said that it would have a devastating impact on access in Louisiana. So we really uh, focused on making that clear to the court letting the court know that the medical consensus continued to be extremely clear and that upholding this law would decimate access in Louisiana while doing nothing for health and safety and that there was just no basis for distinguishing this case from the Texas case four years ago. And ultimately that was the court's ruling. So when the court ruled on June 29th and struck down this law, the five justices who voted to strike it down really said that this was the same case as the Texas case. And most importantly, Chief Justice Roberts, who was our fifth vote to strike down this law, said that there was just no basis for distinguishing between this case and the earlier case. And because of stare decisis and precedent, he was voting to strike down the Louisiana law. So that's a brief description of what this case was about. Excellent. Um, so Mary, maybe I'll turn to you next. We'll do a little more law. Um, there was a debate after this decision came down about whether it was, uh, I mean, obviously from Julie's point of view, um, and from the point of view of pro abortion providers and women seeking abortions in Louisiana, this is an important victory. It means that mm -hmm. 
I think a total of three clinics stay open in the state. And I think it also at least in the present means that we will have at least one clinic in every state in the country. Um, and yet, and, and maybe if I'm, if I'm wrong about that, you should tell me why. Um, and yet, I think from the point of view of people who care about abortion access, there was also um, something to fear in this ruling about the future. Um, Mary, I wonder how you kind of balanced um, where you think the court might be headed based particularly on the concurrence from Chief Justice Roberts, which is a, a controlling concurrence, given that we're talking about the kind of 4-1-4 split, where the fifth Supreme Court vote then um, narrows the scope of the majority ruling in a way that would appear itself to be precedent setting. Yeah, I, I think um, I tended to be one of the kind of glass half empty people um, in terms of what this means for the future in terms of abortion access. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts, the, probably the most significant thing he did was to rewrite what it means for law to be unduly burdensome. Uh, before, partly because of Holman's Health, the Texas case that Julie referenced, courts would have to look at both the benefits and burdens of abortion restrictions. And also, I think significantly, we're not told to defer to legislators when they claimed that there was scientific uncertainty. And that strategy, the sort of creation of or claim of scientific uncertainty is behind a lot of the laws that you see unfolding in some of the states, whether that's restrictions on abortion and telemedicine, or fetal pain laws that ban abortion at 20 weeks, or bans on other specific abortion techniques. Um, so I think that Roberts, while saying he was respecting precedent, was also kind of transforming what precedent was. So it's sort of hard to figure out what that means for the future, because of course, on the one hand, Roe v. Wade and Casey and all of their progeny are precedents, and it's hard to imagine the same John Roberts who wrote that controlling concurrence just easily ignoring those precedents and, and treating them as if they're irrelevant. At the same time, Roberts seems to feel pretty free reconfiguring precedent all while claiming to respect it. And I think if you have followed or studied the anti-abortion movement closely, there are pretty clear kind of breadcrumb trails in June Medical for abortion opponents to follow if they want to get Roberts to uphold restrictions in the future. Um, I think especially those that uh, at least seem to involve a claim of scientific uncertainty. Um, it was interesting to me that he explicitly mentioned that um, as one of the reasons he parted ways with the court's liberal majority. Um, we hadn't really made that explicit, but while Roberts joined uh, his more liberal colleagues in striking down the Louisiana law, he didn't actually join their opinion. He wrote his own sort of special opinion and in outlining why he didn't join his liberal colleagues, um, the reasons were that he thought they got the undue burden test wrong, partly because they weren't um, looking as closely at what state legislators were claiming to be doing. Um, another interesting sort of what's next question from the anti-abortion side is whether we're going to see more of the kinds of strategy that Julie was coping with in this case. In other words, laws that claim to protect uh, patients. And there's no shortage of laws like that still around. There are, um, for example, the American Medical Association is challenging a law that requires patients to hear that abortions can be reversed, which isn't something that's really backed by evidence. Um, they're the kinds of laws I already mentioned, which seem to be focusing on later procedures. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how much this and Holman's Health shift the anti-abortion movement away from claims to protect patients and toward more kind of fetal life oriented claims. There's reason to think the anti-abortion movement wants to do that anyway. If you guys remember last year, we had heartbeat bills, we had Alabama's absolute ban, all the states that I live next to seem to have introduced a sort of sweeping abortion ban in 2019. Um, so there, there's already some momentum going in that direction. But I think there are still reasons you might see abortion opponents claiming to protect patients, I think, um, that we can talk about a little more in the Q&A. But that's, I think there's going to be an interesting strategic division in the anti-abortion movement produced by this case, too. Um, so, Jamil, as an advocate watching all of this, um, did what does this mean for your kind of future work on this? Um, do you, there there have been in the last year or so some really positive developments for people who care about the right to abortion? Um, I would argue, uh, 
put more of a push, at least in the democratic field, to talk about um, public funding for abortion, something that has seemed to be off the table in a lot of states and from the point of view of Congress for a long time. Now it's getting an airing again. Um, do you see this case as a kind of temporary relief that then allows for mo momentum to build on, um, on these more sort of proactive fronts? Or do you think that there'll be a lot of defense, um, defensive actions being fought? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, I I would say both of what you that's work the world of working in the reproductive health rights and justice movements that we're always trying to balance both both. I mean, to your point, we have seen um some great advancements over uh, the course of even since I've been uh working doing this work. Um, you know, 2016 marked the first time we saw uh the DNC platform including a repeat of the Hyde Amendment and the Hyde Amendment, excuse me. Uh, we also saw in 2019 more proactive uh, abortion legislation advanced. We've seen states requiring abortion coverage, uh, uh, specifically California, New York, uh, Maine. And so we have seen some great advancements. And of course, this design was another great advancement. But, you know, I think we're going to repro long enough to uh, also probably take some of uh, what, what Mary mentioned as well. And that what well, this is a great, in, in no way means we can let up, you know, uh, last year or even to some group marker day. We saw bans for genetic anomalies, six bans on race, 10 for sex selection, uh, abortion. And so, and that was just uh, uh, as of July 1st. And so um, I think to Mary's point, we will see the anti-abortion activists try to re-trigger their strategy and try to think about uh, ways to get a case before the Supreme Court. You know, I'll just say probably, for advocates, I'll say it a little bit more explicit. I do uh, a signal that, that, you know, bring me perhaps the, the right case and we, and we might uh, come out with a, with a different decision. Um, and so we will see um, uh, those anti-abortion activists look to look to try to to to, to bring one of these uh, uh, cases up before the court, or even just uh, through working through the lower courts. You know, we saw just on Monday, uh, we saw in another case, CR was involved in Tennessee, uh, had a uh, passed one of the most restrictive abortion bans in the country, prohibiting abortion after six weeks, and we saw. Fortunately, a court uh, blocked that uh, immediately, but and, and that a similar fate had met in, in cases out of Georgia and Mississippi. So we'll see all sorts of bans, all sorts of laws uh, try, and I think that is even more reason why, from my perspective, uh, it's imperative on our lawmakers to pass proactive policies that we shouldn't just be relying on the courts. If we had um, laws like the Women's Health Protection Act and, and others uh, on the books, we wouldn't have even had to to get to get to this point. And perhaps Julie may be able to take a a, a well a vacation uh, because we wouldn't be relying upon the courts. Um, Louise, I wonder what you're seeing among abortion providers. It seems to me, in some ways this was a kind of um, retention of the status quo, this decision. I mean, if the, if the Supreme Court had come out another way, we would be seeing all around the country states trying to eliminate abortion clinics entirely. Um, instead, there's gonna be a kind of holding pattern, I think, where that may eventually happen with some future restriction that Roberts thinks um, is acceptable to uphold, or it may not. And I wonder how abortion providers are thinking about that kind of potential next phase? I think you're correct to describe it as a holding pattern um, that, that the next phase at least doesn't look much different at the moment than it did at the time of Whole Women's Health, although we do anticipate with the change in the court's composition a little bit more anxiety there. But I think that the, the frustration that has been present for abortion providers and, a, and just providers for women's health in general um, exists and continues to exist because from the standpoint of scientific uncertainty, um, you know, we've had a 30 plus year uh, natural experiment where there are states in which there are not restrictive um, uh, legislation against abortion and, and it is the safest ambulatory procedure that any that is performed across all disciplines. 
So we know it's safe. There's no need for any further intervention. And, and from a researcher standpoint, from, as somebody who works in the sphere of uh, research around patient safety, mainly from a surgical standpoint, there is no reason to interfere with something that is already proven to be safe. And, and so um, the court, just from the standpoint of providers who are in this sphere who are not well versed with the law, they become very confused when we start talking about undue burdens and don't realize that that has to do with access and not with the enormous amount of burdens that women face just in accessing regular care, let alone abortion care. And then all of these unnecessary, unproven, untested, unresearched um, interventions from a legislative standpoint that have nothing to do with, with safety. So that frustration is just continuing to boil, if that's helpful. Julie, since you're um, the litigator among us, I can't resist asking you what, if anything, you see coming down the pike as you kind of closely read this decision. Sure, yes. I think um, while the decision was a, was a really huge victory for people in Louisiana and it was critical to hold the line, like you and Mary said and Jamil, it, there really is a lot to be concerned about in this decision. And I want to you know make sure people are aware of that because as Jamil was saying, um, we have to continue to be really vigilant and concerned. Um, so first of all, as Mary mentioned, you know, Chief Justice Roberts gave us this fifth vote only because of stare decisis and only because of precedent. Um, if there hadn't been an identical case that the Supreme Court had decided just four years ago, we don't know how this case would have come out. And so we had to fight incredibly hard just to preserve the status quo and we only preserve the status quo by five to four vote um, and there are lots of things to be concerned about in the four dissenting opinions that the other justices issued and if we have more time later I can talk about some of them because there was another legal issue that was going on in this case which had to do with whether medical providers like Louise and others can actually bring these lawsuits on behalf of their patients and the precedent is just as clear on that issue as on the right to abortion that they can and that they should and that they're absolutely the appropriate people to bring these kinds of cases. And yet um, four of the justices would have taken that ability away, which is really just another effort to put abortion out of reach for people by closing down the courthouse doors to challenges to abortion restrictions. So you know, lots of things to be concerned about in this case. Um, and sort of picking up on what Jamil said, really what we're worried about today for abortion is access. So the legal right has been around for a long time, but so many people don't actually have access to abortion. They can't access healthcare services, especially people of color, especially poor people, young people, rural people. So that's the real issue. And so what we really need to be doing is expanding access to abortion. And this is not the kind of opinion that suggests that we're gonna be able to do that um, with the current US Supreme Court. So as Jamil was saying, we really need to be focusing on other types of strategies. Um, the courts continue to be critical and important. They're blocking these bans, but in order to expand access to abortion, we have to use all of our strategies. And that's what we really need to do right now because there are too many states that have only one clinic left or even Louisiana has only three clinics left. And there's just too, too many people being left behind right now. So I think that's, that's the fight going forward is to figure out how we can expand access and make um, abortion something that you know, everybody, it's right that's meaningful to everyone, not just to some people in the country. So one possibility for expanding access is um, telemedicine for particularly um, medical abortions where you take pills rather than have surgery. And there are many ways, um, and, and maybe Jamil can talk about this, in which COVID in the United States has been a barrier to abortion. In some other countries, particularly the United Kingdom, um, COVID has presented a kind of um, accidental opportunity to expand access by um, getting the government to waive previous restrictions that required in-person visits for taking abortion pills. And so now we're seeing brand new guidelines in Britain that are allowing women to have um, abortions via telemedicine. When you think of the um, problems with clinic closing and lack of geographic proximity to clinics being such a barrier to access in the United States, this sort of, if it's safe and effective and um, medically recommended, seems like an answer. 
And yet um, there are many legal um, challenges um, preventing that from happening. Um, Louise, from your point of view as a provider, what do you think about this landscape? I mean, it's um, one in which we've gotten, I think, more research in recent years about um, how safe and effective medical abortion can be. Do you think that this could be a real game changer in the future um, from a kind of medical and scientific point of view? Yeah, short answer, absolutely. I mean, we should absolutely make uh, telemedicine available in this, in this realm and in any other realms. There's been a lot of resistance to telemedicine across the board. And, you know, I'm now seeing my pre-op surgical patients um, doing that by Zoom as we are right now. And obviously- HIPAA compliance Zoom. Excuse me, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Zoom. And, um, and then I meet them the day of surgery. And if there's an issue we deal that I couldn't have assessed that way, we deal with it when we can finally be together. And that saves them money and it um, makes their access easier. And we might have more than one appointment more easily and with less cost. I mean, it's just so beneficial. So why wouldn't we then make that available in a much safer realm? You know, I'm, I'm doing complex five-hour surgeries and doing Zoom ahead of initiating that level of care, which is very complex. So the idea that this would not be available to women who are gonna be using this incredibly safe and, and preferable mode of terminating a pregnancy is, is incomprehensible to me, especially since that, that will speed the process up and every single day we shave off um, makes that procedure safer. So I do hope we'll move forward. We're way behind the eight ball internationally, as you mentioned, referencing uh, England and other areas in Europe, course as well. So we're way behind the trend here and we need to catch up. Jamil, what are you seeing about um, telemedicine and medical abortion from an advocacy point of view? Um, I should mention that one, I don't know if controversial is the right word, but one sort of tricky part of this is that I think sometimes clinics, which are physically based, worry about losing patients to this future in which someone can um, place a phone call, see someone in another state, these clinics that have tried so hard to stay open, born a lot of cost to do that. What's the balance there? How do we think about that part of this potentially future picture? Should we lose Jamil for a sec? We agree, Lou. Oh, uh, you know, uh, tell can you, can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. How about you guys? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, I was, as, uh, what I was saying was that I totally uh, agree with um, Louise that telemedicine presents an enormous opportunity to increase access to abortion as well as a number of other services. You know, the way I like to, that I've been describing the COVID pandemic is that it has really just exposed the number of barriers in our healthcare system that have long plagued um, particularly Black and brown people in this country, as well as lower income people and people living in rural areas. And so I do think that telemedicine uh, presents an enormous opportunity to increase access to care. You know, one practical, very practical barrier that we've seen um, is that on the abortion front, we have, you know, because there's such a limited number of abortion providers in this country, many abortion providers, particularly in the South, travel there in order to provide care. And uh, um, or patients have to travel either within the state or outside of the state in order to access care. And with travel restrictions and, and, and encouraging uh, people to stay at home, that presents a very practical barrier. Or if one abortion provider in the community gets sick or needs to quarantine, then you could have an entire state or even region losing abortion access. And so uh, telemedicine uh, can present a, a good opportunity for people to be able to access care. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, that's on the practical side and on the political uh, side, we've seen um, uh, the uh, federal government had waived some in-person requirements for other conditions and refused to waive some of those requirements for people to access the medication, abortion pill, uh, specifically mifepristone. Um, and, and, and this past Monday, a judge uh, said that uh, people have to be able to or, or can be afforded that access, at least during the pandemic. Uh, and so while that's great encouraging news, none of these problems are new, right? So 
that needs to, it, from my perspective, go beyond just the uh, uh, emergency and people should be able to access um, a, a medication, abortion, uh, even, uh, without uh, getting having an in-person um, visit, uh, even beyond the current crisis. Um, but to the second part of your question, you know, it is, um, it's telemedicine as, as great as it is, it is not the end-all be-all answer for everyone. And uh, it's important to have in-person clinics and, and providers available for people. You know, I was joking with my mother last week who um, refused to do a telemedicine visit with her uh, doctor. Uh, and, you know, I have, can have my opinions about that, but that's her right. And if she wants to, wants to go in to visit a provider, she should have that access. So, you know, that's a long way of saying telemedicine presents an enormous opportunity, um, but there uh, should also be um, increased funding for uh, abortion providers. We've seen this uh, administration scale back um, the family planning program um, harming abortion providers. And so we need to ensure that those providers can continue to exist and people can access care in a range of ways they, they, they want or choose to. Mary, do you want to jump in there? And I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you think medical abortion and telemedicine could have a greater role, if you think that's right, in the American um, landscape of providing the service. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing to remember is that um, this is still a supreme, a conservative Supreme Court majority, and I think it's still quite possible that the world we kind of saw previewed last year, where states were banning all or most abortions, will become a reality in large parts of you know the American South and the Midwest. And so, one of the questions that I think those laws raise, were they ever to go into effect, would be how will they be enforced? And if telemedicine was an option the answer would be that it would be very difficult to enforce them. Um, and that if they were to be enforced, it would make it even trickier from a political standpoint for anti-abortion legislators, because it would raise the question of, well, well, who do you punish, right? If women or, or patients are accessing telemedicine, you know, you can't, it would be very hard for a variety of reasons to punish, you know, the provider or whoever gave the services who's out of state, presumably in a place where abortion is safe and legal. Um, that leaves the patient. And as m most of you know, there's been a very strong um, kind of consistent message from the anti-abortion movement that patients are off the table, that no one is going to punish patients. So I think if we're imagining a world where potentially there is no Roe v. Wade, there is no federal right to abortion, I think telemedicine is really huge. Like I, it, it, to say as a game changer is kind of an understatement in terms of both what it would mean for access and also how it would change the rules, I think, both of the political and legal game in states that are likely to ban all abortions or most of them. I wrote a story a few years ago about a mother who had helped her daughter have a medical abortion by ordering pills on the internet mm -hmm. um, and ended up in jail because the mother, because she, um, her daughter had some complications or they were worried about the bleeding. And so they went to the ER and they told the ER providers that these, the, the daughter had taken abortion pills, which actually they didn't really need to do because you present as if you're miscarrying. Um, but they didn't know that. They thought they were providing the complete health information. And then they were actually reported to the police and arrested and mm -hmm. this mom was prosecuted. So, and went to jail for months. Um, I mean, this is an unusual story in the United States still, but it's, it has happened. And I tell the story because I think it goes to your point about what the kind of end game of banning these procedures is. Um, in order to really stop them, you have to prosecute women. Um, usually people who are um, oppose abortion don't want to be, um, don't, that, that eventuality goes kind of unsaid because um, it's politically fraught for them. Um, Julie, as you're looking at this, the legal picture for expanding access to telemedicine and medical abortion, um, how encouraged are you by this federal district court decision from this week that Mary talked about? Do you think that's something that an appeals court might uphold? Um, what, where, what kind of steps do you see um, out there, legally speaking, for this to become something that's more available? And I should note that there are, I think, 18 or 19 states that currently ban abortion by telemedicine. And so that's the way they've put up a barrier to this kind of access. Right. Um, so the decision is absolutely great news because what we have is a federal judge 
just recognizing what we all know is true, as Jamil said, which is that you do not need to go in person to receive a pill. Um, that people in the United States get medication all the time um, through pharmacies and another context, and that this is a rule that really singled out abortion for different treatment, as we see happening all the time. Um, I hope very much an appeals court will uphold this ruling, but I think, you know, again, something for people to understand is as great as this ruling is, these restrictions shouldn't have been in place to begin with. Um, and really, they should be removed completely, as Jamil said, because there are other restrictions that this particular decision on Monday didn't block. Um, but in addition, what this opinion on Monday made clear is that it said nothing about all of the different state laws that impose barriers to abortion that still require people in so many states to go for an in-person visit, even go for an in-person visit twice, um, that prohibit telemedicine, that you know, require an ultrasound before an abortion. So this is, it's, it's great. I think it will expand access for some people, but in many states, unfortunately, it won't make a difference because of this web of restrictions and barriers that are already in place. So I think, again, um, it's really important to think about going forward, how can we get rid of these restrictions? How can we expand access? How can we reduce disparities, especially racial disparities in access to abortion and other types of healthcare services? Because that's what we really see um, with all of these restric restrictions. That's who they disproportionately impact. And when you're talking about prosecutions um, of, of people who get abortions, you know, that's another time. There are not that many prosecutions, but most of the time when they happen, the people who are being prosecuted are poor people of color. Um, and so you know, that, that's what's really important. This decision was great, but it doesn't really change the fact that access to abortion in the United States continues to be a complete patchwork. Um, and it depends on where you live. And it depends on whether you're poor or low income. And if you're a person of color, whether or not you can access abortion. So the fight to knock down the whole web of restrictions really state by state has to continue. Um, maybe I'll turn for a moment to the kind of politics of this situation. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Jamil. Are there um, levers to pull for people who want to expand abortion access? What do you see as the kind of most um, potentially effective political pressure points? Right now, we're heading into a November election in which there's a lot up for grabs and a lot at stake, but I wonder what you think the most effective use of the time and energy of the pro-choice movement is right now. Yeah, now that's a great question. I mean, you know, it picks up off of something Julie raised earlier, which about, but you know, these court cases can maintain the status quo, um, but it's not not going to push a proactive vision for abortion that we desperately need, in particular for um, Black and Latina women in this country. So maintaining the status quo has meant that many can't access abortion, um, and whether or not uh, they we get court rulings won't 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 necessarily change that. Uh, for some people. And so um, when you talk about important levers, I mean, always I'll encourage you to call your Congress members. You know, I talked about, I mentioned the Women's Health Protection Act earlier uh, that would have removed restriction, uh, would, would prohibit some state bans, uh, such as the one that was at issue in June. Um, but there's also coverage restrictions. So, you know, there's a restriction, as you mentioned, around federal funding going to um, abortion, um, uh, the, the uh, quote unquote Hyde Amendment. And that has prohibited low income women, particularly those who rely on Medicaid, um, from being able to access abortion because they simply can't cover it. You can have all of the abortion providers, you can have unlimited access, but if you can't afford it, uh, that sort of this quote unquote right to abortion will, me will mean nothing. Um, also, uh, you know, I have a colleague who is always thinking about the court and always thinking about uh, judicial non nominations, you know, uh, the this administration has uh, set a record setting number of uh, nominations and has been very explicit about um, uh, putting uh, anti-abortion um, uh, uh, appointing, uh, nominating anti-abortion uh, judges and justices to the courts. And so people should pay attention to those things. People should, um, you know, we call about, we might call about legislation, might go out and rally about those things. Very few times can we get people to go rally about a nomination for a judge, but it's very important. And when we talk, we think about 
um, justices, it's going to be so alarming where you, you know, the, um, these are decisions that they can, and the judges we put on the courts will impact us for the rest, could impact some of us for the rest of our lives. Um, uh, and so uh, you might be able to vote out your uh, a member of Congress, but not being able to vote out that judge, but you do have a say um, uh, when, when these nominations come before your lawmakers. So those are things that I would encourage people to, to pay attention to and pay attention to all the things at your, at your state level. Mary, do you want to add something? Your book covers politics as well as law. I think state law is, is really easy to underestimate. So if you look at kind of, the, there, so the Hyde Amendment is a huge historical counterexample, right? I think the Hyde Amendment was the blueprint for everything the anti-abortion movement has done between now and then to unravel abortion rights. So it's you cannot understate the importance of that, not just for poor women and women of color, but for just period across the board in terms of kind of creating a roadmap for everything that's come since. But really in significant ways, a lot of the action in the abortion space is in the states, right? After the Tea Party wave in 2010, we've had an unprecedented, num unprecedented excuse me, number of abortion restrictions coming out of the states. Um, leading anti-abortion groups have um, playbooks that they send state legislators every year. So the fact that the laws that Julie saw in Texas and Louisiana were exactly the same is no coincidence. They're coming from a kind of DC-based organization that has a game plan for how and when to approach John Roberts to take the next step toward eliminating abortion rights. And I think that historically, um, cons have been better, I think, at prioritizing state legislatures, at kind of gaming the system to gain control of state legislatures. So I think same goes for state courts, I think. Um, if we are maybe heading to a post Roe v. Wade world, eventually that's going to make state constitutions and state Supreme Courts really vital. And so I think it's it's often less sexy for people to focus on the states. I don't think that you know most people don't necessarily know who's on their state Supreme Court or who's in their state legislature or even in extreme cases who their governor is. Hopefully you know who your governor is. But I would say that uh, people interested in this issue should pay more attention to state legislatures and do more um, to influence state legislatures um, if they want things to go in a different direction. Um, Louise or Julie, do you want to jump in? Don't feel like you have to, I can also change. No, I would just say um, all of, the, of what's been suggested so far is so important and it all boils down to vote, vote at every level, you know? And so if you're interested in any topic, but specifically this one, not only write to your different congressmen or even local legislators, but then anytime there's a, an electoral um, event, bring yourself and everybody else in your neighborhood out there to get out there and vote. Because if we really voted based on our population, we would change this national picture quite quickly. Um, I'm going to turn, unless Julie, did you want to add something? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You're good. I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, the strategy of abortion opponents picking this Louisiana law and how it made its way to the Supreme Court. So one comes from Glenn Cohen. He asks, um, no matter what you think about their politics, there's a lot of clever lawyering behind the anti-abortion movement. The change in the court's membership gave a good opportunity to push the law in their favor. But why choose such a seemingly bad vehicle for doing so? Uh, of, and I think he's talking about the Louisiana law here, why choose a carbon copy of Whole Women's Health, which is the previous um, case we've talked about from Texas, as opposed to a number of other more different abortion restrictions that have been introduced and are percolating? Um, what do you think they were thinking? Julie, um, maybe I'll give that one to you. Sure. Um, so I think- to you after Julie, because I have thoughts on that too. Oh, good, excellent, sorry. Absolutely. Um, I'll give the more sort of concrete answer, which I think lots of people don't realize, which is that we brought this case to the Supreme Court, not the state of Louisiana. Um, so it's important for people to understand what happened was the state of Louisiana did essentially ignore what the Supreme Court said about the Texas law, and it continued to defend this law even after the 2016 decision from the Supreme Court. So this Louisiana litigation was already percolating at the time. There was actually litigation against lots of other um, identical laws because as Mary explained, we have the same laws being passed in multiple states because of this playbook um, that the anti-abortion um, movement uses. So 
this case was already percolating. Louisiana would not give up defending this law. And then the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, so the Federal Court of Appeals that covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, it also ignored the Supreme Court's decision, and it decided to uphold this Louisiana law, despite what the Supreme Court had said in 2016. And so we took it to the Supreme Court, and we asked the Supreme Court to step in, and we said, how can this be? How can you have a different outcome in Louisiana versus Texas on an identical law that just can't be right? It violates basic rule of law principles. And so the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case and then ultimately gave us this five to four decision. Um, but that was really our decision as the, unfortunately, the parties that lost at the Court of Appeals to ask the Supreme Court to step in. I'm sure Louisiana had hoped that it would stay at the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court wouldn't take the case at all. Were you nervous about bringing that appeal? Um, I know there's lots of um, strategizing and thinking among pro-choice advocates about when to approach the court. And I wonder if you were worried that it would come out differently. We were definitely worried. We absolutely were worried, but we felt that with our clients um, and for the people in Louisiana that we really owed it to them to, to keep fighting, to be brave and bold, because if we hadn't kept fighting, this law would have taken effect years ago. And so we felt that if we weren't willing to fight on a law that was identical to one that the Supreme Court had just struck down, really, you know, as litigators, we should pack up our bags and go home. Um, so we felt it was critical to, to put up the fight. And fortunately, we were able to block the law in this instance. Mary, I know you want to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, Julia's account is absolutely right, but I think there wasn't as much unhappiness in the anti-abortion movement from what I've seen as you would expect. And I think the reasons for that are twofold. I think one, there was a sort of almost delirious optimism in the anti-abortion movement after Brett Kavanaugh joined the court. And the sort of savvier players in the anti-abortion movement understood that the court is not gonna overturn Roe tomorrow, but this was sort of a soft kind of absolutism, right? Try to get the court to overrule a precedent immediately, kind of test the waters, test Brett Kavanaugh, test Neil Gorsuch. Um, and the other, I think, fairly significant thing is there are some within the anti-abortion movement, particularly um, Americans United for Life, which was sort of the force behind this law, that believe that the only way the Supreme Court will overrule Roe is if the Supreme Court holds and believes that patients and specifically women no longer need abortion to achieve equal citizenship. And so there's a sort of dogged commitment to that argument in the face of lots and lots of setbacks that uh, continues to exist in some wings of the anti-abortion movement. So I don't think this was kind of the ideal law, but there were people um, in the action movement who definitely saw this as a blessing in disguise for both of those reasons, because they wanted to give the opportunity to show that it was willing to disregard precedent very quickly. And they wanted to give the court an opportunity to kind of start down this path to saying that abortion was in fact dangerous or harmful for women. That argument was written into both the kind of standing arguments that Julie talked about um, and into the statute itself. So there wasn't really as much reluctance as I would have expected given all of those things. Do you, um, do you all think that the Supreme Court will refrain from taking another abortion case for another few years? Um, I mean, that would be a continuing maintaining of the status quo. Um, and I ask that in part because um, there's been a split in the anti-abortion movement for a long time between the more complete bans, um, like the six-week bans we've talked about, and these more incremental strategies. Um, and in some ways, the um, tactic of Americans United for Life was discredited by this decision. Um, it suggests to the more radical folks in the movement, like, you might as well try for a complete ban because you're not going to get approval for this more um, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs strategy, at least not through this vehicle. Um, so do you think, maybe I'll give this to you, Julie. I mean, do you think the Supreme Court will sort of stay out of it for a while? Um, let more states pass telemedicine bans, for example, um, and let the country kind of divide on this issue geographically? Or do you see, think there's more of an appetite to step back in? It's a really hard question. I'd love to see what others think. I think just, you know, the reality is the court doesn't take an abortion case every year. Um, we know that there's usually at least a three to four year gap between cases, sometimes longer. So I think it would be unusual for the court to take another case next term, for example. Um, I think for the bans, just because we've been talking about the bans, just the very straight up bans that ban abortion after a certain point in pregnancy, 
they are so clearly unconstitutional. There are literally, I think, at least 20 decisions between state and federal courts that have struck down these laws. So if the federal courts of appeals continue to strike them down, it really doesn't seem like one of those is likely to get to the court. Um, but all of these other types of restrictions that are a little bit different, you know, the bans for a particular reason, as Jamil um, noted, it's harder to predict, Emily, what's going to happen to those cases. Um, but as we all know, you know, it's up to the court if it wants to hear a case. So um, there's plenty of cases in the pipeline that the court could take at any time. I mean, this, the states have been um, asking the court to step on, on every single legal victory that we have had at the courts of appeal. So they've been very aggressive in requesting the court to come into a case. So there'll be plenty of opportunities if it wants to do so. Um, I'm gonna turn back to the questions. This one comes from Janita Dill Gina Dillon, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, more of a comment than question, but curious what you think. I appreciate the good point that we may see the abortion, the anti-abortion movement split and focus more on fetal life as opposed to protectionist um, health and safety justifications for restrictions. The extent the argument um, are, is still used though, and I think um, Gina means the argument about um, health and safety, about laws protecting women's health, pa abortion patients' health and safety. The extent those arguments are still used, there's new research from the Center for Reproductive Rights that seems relevant, um, also from IBIS, which shows that where we see abortion restrictions, we also see fewer policies in place to support women and families, meaning you know, helping low-income women take care of kids, helping families um, with all the expenses that come with childbearing. Um, and this indicates that, in fact, policymakers do not support or care about women and families. Could this be helpful in pointing to the contradiction in the anti-abortion movement's justifications? Um, I think this is sort of a, a classic um, question from people who support abortion rights um, uh, to abortion opponents asking about if there's all this concern about fetal life, what about after the baby's born? What about those same people who are disproportionately um, low income? Uh, Jamil, I wonder what you think about that, um, whether you feel like that message um, gets across, how it, if it doesn't get across, how, why not? You know, it's a great question. It's something I've asked myself now for as long as I've done this work because it is to me a grave contradiction. Um, maybe I'm a pessimist. Do I think it will ultimately break through? Uh, probably not. I mean, and but it is a good point to raise that, you know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about um, abortion, but of course, reproductive rights is a much broader and people and we have people who've ex experienced care um, uh, barriers to access and care, particularly at this moment um, related to even maternal health, uh, you know, so currently a maternal health crisis in this country where black and brown women are uh, three, to, three to four times more likely um, to die uh, as a result of pregnancy complications. We have barriers to access to contraceptives, which also the same folks who tend to be uh, opposed to abortion um, also are opposed to preventing uh, somehow contradictory unplanned pregnancies. Um, and, you know, this moment with the coronavirus has sort of exposed and exacerbated those existing barriers. Um, and, you know, we frequently try to make this argument that uh, if you really are, are anti-abortion, well, of course, we believe women should be able to make whatever decision they want about uh, their their uh, birth choices. Um, but if you abortion is really your um, uh, your uh, reason, um, then you should uh, be uh, supportive of. Uh, of policies that improve maternal health and contraceptive access, and these same folks usually are are not. Um, and so, uh, do do I think it'll probably ever break through? Probably, probably not. I mean, we keep trying and be hopeful that um, uh, you know one one day it will. Um, I see. Let's see. I see a few things in here. So, um, Louise, do you want to? talk a little bit about this um, question to loop back earlier to um, the, so we were talking about the secondary aspect of um, June Medical which is this question about who can sue over an abortion restriction can providers sue on behalf of their patients do patients have to sue themselves um, 
as a provider, what's your kind of concern and thinking about that area of law we're seeing, um, which did not actually change, I don't think, in this decision, but um, but could have. It could have, yeah. And I'm so glad Julie brought it up, and I, I love Julie and Mary's comments. But my understanding is that would apply very broadly if it was ever um, struck down. And um, one of the primary roles that I see in my identity as a physician is as an advocate for my patients. So the idea that that um, role as an advocate would be limited in my ability to bring forward um, their concerns, uh, you know, they can also bring forward their own concerns, but that's their ability to do so might be much more limited than mine. And, and so just as we uh, advocate for our patients when they um, have less of a voice and less agency, this, that is one of our primary roles. So to have that limited is very frightening to me. And I think be interesting to um, write more about that, speak more about that, and how broad that would be. It's not limited to the abortion question, if I understand it correctly, and please correct me. Um, I think I'm going to, we have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to pull one from uh, Radhika Rao. Sorry, I'm probably saying your name incorrectly by mistake. Um, you're wondering what impact um, the panelists think the Black Lives Matter movement will have on abortion rights and the reproductive justice movement, as well as the Supreme Court. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the reproductive justice movement, which has been a really important development, and I think an increasingly strong voice um, in this world. Uh, anyone, maybe Mary, you could take that one? Um, it's it's hard to predict. I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen historically is a kind of marginalization of concerns in the reproductive health space generally, or issues that primarily affect non-white women, the Hyde Amendment being kind of a key example. So it's it's significant and really striking that until 2016, the Democratic National Platform didn't include the repeal of the Hyde Amendment. And that was when the Democratic Party really since at least 1980 was the pro-choice party. And so I think the reproductive justice movement has been in significant ways kind of holding both the Democratic Party to account and holding the kind of institutional DC pro-choice movement to account. Um, it'll be interesting to see exactly how far that goes, especially, for example, if Democrats were to win the White House and the Senate in 2020. I think we'd see a debate about the Women's Health Protection Act and whether it in fact goes far enough. Um, the bill, for example, doesn't include repeal of the Hyde Amendment. There is a separate bill that includes repeal of the Hyde Amendment, but I think you would see reproductive justice advocates asking why that wasn't important enough to appear in the kind of main bill. Um, you might see a push for other issues, at a minimum issues like contraceptive access, which of course the Supreme Court dealt with in the Little Sisters opinion this term, um, effectively limiting it. So I think that there's going to be, um, and already has been, some sign that um, even though some reproductive justice issues have long been believed not to play well at the polls or to appeal to the kind of average American voter, um, I think we've seen progressive movements and even the Democratic Party take those issues more seriously, and I would expect to see more of that um, in the years to come. Jamil, did you want to jump in? I, the, Can the, I chime in? Yeah, the box yeah, moved yeah. to your screen, so I thought maybe you wanted to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, so I did. I close did. it out for us. Okay. Oh, oh, pre the pressure, pressure. Too now. much pressure. Yeah, Sorry. No, love, love, love. <laughs> I love it. Appreciate that question because you know, re for those who aren't familiar, you know, the reproductive justice movement was found by uh, black women um, uh, in the in the eighties and has pushed forward a lot of what we're talking about, whether it's about the Hyde Amendment or or broader issues uh, around maternal health and around. Um, uh, around domestic violence, around paid leave. And, and I do think that uh, that movement has propelled forward a lot of us in the, in the traditional reproductive rights movement and will continue to do so. I know, you know, and they definitely, uh, for many of those Black women-led organizations, consider the Black Lives Matter movement a part of that because in order to uh, safely raise, you feel like you um, have reproductive autonomy and, and, and it includes your ability to safely raise your children and then and including your black children without them being killed by the police and it also gets to the question that was asked before about whether or not sort of making some of these more practical arguments would get to uh sort of the uh, um uh would appeal to some of
of those who are opposed to abortion. And one thing I was remiss to not mention is that no, because I do think a lot of these um, laws and a lot of the restrictions around abortion are explicitly about controlling women's bodies and explicitly around controlling Black women's bodies. And so it will be sort of those reproductive justice advocates, I think, that will continue to propel us forward as they have, because it's also, this is a racial justice issue. That, I think, is actually an excellent ending. You did that perfectly. Um, thank you all so much for this terrific discussion. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And thank you to the Petrie Flom Center for hosting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Everybody.